thanks to Weights and Biases for supporting my channel. When we talk about neural networks, we often compare them to the human brain. In fact, perceptrons, the building blocks of neural networks, were originally designed to resemble neurons. But there's been some debate as to how much neural networks are actually like our brains and how much perceptrons are actually like neurons. Luckily for us, a few people decided to test that theory in some preprints that came out in 2019 and 2020, so I thought we could talk a bit about what they saw and how that might inform our current understanding of how much neural networks are actually like your brain. As always, when we talk about preprints, it's important to note that these papers have not been peer-reviewed or validated by any external third party. In the case of both of these preprints, the code used to develop both is actually publicly available on GitHub, and I'll include the links to those in the description. In fact, you can actually play with the code from the first paper on on Kaggle, where the authors uploaded a notebook for anyone to use. So the first preprint is entitled Single Cortical Neurons as Deep Artificial Neural Networks. And in it, the authors are interested in figuring out exactly how big of a deep neural network you would need to model a single neuron in the cortex, which is the outer layer of your cerebrum. The authors start by trying to actually replicate a fairly simple model of how neurons work called the integrate and fire method. The integrate and fire method is very similar to what perceptrons actually do. So in this case, they're able to create a neural network with a single hidden layer that has one unit that is able to replicate the integrate and fire model. Next they get a little more complicated by making a model of a layer 5 pyramidal neuron which is a type of neuron that you can find in the cortex and they do this by taking into account the different types of receptors that these neurons typically have and how those receptors work together to lead to action potentials. Having generated this synthetic data from their neuron they then train several deep neural networks to see what the smallest deep neural network you can use is that still replicates the signals that we see in the synthetic data from our neuron. And before I tell you, comment below with how big a neural network you think they needed in terms of the number of hidden layers. Okay, replicating a single cortical neuron required a neural network with seven hidden layers. You can see from this figure that different parts of the network end up representing different parts of the neuron, which is pretty interesting. What's also interesting is that the authors go back to that model of the neuron and remove one type of receptor, which allows them to shrink the size of their deep neural network from seven layers to one. The one factor that they remove are called NMDA receptors, and in addition to being receptive to the incoming signals that they receive, NMDA receptors also respond to the signals that neighboring receptors receive, which introduces a significant amount of complexity to how neurons decide whether or not to fire. Now, while the smaller network still requires multiple perceptrons to replicate the original single neuron, it is interesting to see how we can remove so much complexity by just taking out one single factor in our neuron showing us how much complexity can be embedded in one small aspect of how neurons function. So from this preprint, we might take away that neurons are extremely complex and that the only way to model them using machine learning is using very complex models. However, this assumes that we can only use deep neural networks to do the modeling, and the second preprint that we're going to look at takes an alternative approach. The second preprint is called Can Single Neurons Solve MNIST? And in it, the authors are interested in seeing whether computational models of dendritic trees can identify the handwritten digital in the MNIST dataset. Dendrites are branched extensions of neurons that relay electrical signals from other neurons, and dendritic trees allow neurons to receive and weight inputs from different cells in different ways. In fact, research has shown that unlike perceptrons, which apply linear weights to the inputs and then sum them and apply a nonlinear activation function, dendrites can actually apply the biological equivalent of a nonlinear activation function to the inputs before they are summed up by the neuron itself. This is an additional layer of complexity that we don't see in perceptron. And the layout of a dendrite tree is highly correlated with the function of the neuron itself. In fact, malformations in dendritic trees are associated with several psychiatric conditions, including schizophrenia, depression, and anxiety. Luckily for us, creating simple models of dendritic trees is pretty straightforward because we generally know what dendritic trees look like. In this preprint, the authors focus on a fairly simple model called the K-tree, and they actually include those nonlinear activations on the inputs as well as at the final summation. They compare the K-tree to a fully connected neural network with a single hidden layer and a linear classifier as a lower bound on accuracy, and find that the tree model performs equal to or better than the linear model, and find that the tree model performs equal to or better than the linear model on all of the data sets, and similar to the neural network on most of the data sets. Why is this interesting? Well, because it suggests that the computational power of dendritic trees may be higher than their design might suggest. 
The authors then go on to model learning, or plasticity, which is the brain's ability to change biological neural networks by growing or reorganizing them. Dendrites are one way to accomplish that change, as changing the structure of dendritic trees changes the ways that neurons respond to incoming signals. In the interest of modeling learning, the authors expand their one tree to several trees, receiving the same input, to see whether adding more trees improves performance on the task of identifying MNIST digits. Interestingly, adding more trees improved the model's performance so much that it was comparable to that of a similarly structured neural network, highlighting the underlying complexity of a seemingly simple model. So this is all really interesting, but what does it mean for the relationship between neurons and perceptrons, or our brains and neural networks? Well, right off the bat, both preprints imply that neurons perform much more complex computations than perceptrons would have you believe. And this is actually something that we knew already from neuroscience research. It also implies that any deep neural network model of the brain will be more complex than the brain itself if we're just comparing perceptrons to neurons. Granted, that doesn't necessarily hold if you consider the parameters that influence whether or not a neuron is firing at any given time. In any case, we can certainly see from the complexity required to build a single neuron that building the brain would be quite an undertaking. It's also important to note that most of these designs don't actually work biologically. Our brains aren't made up of fully connected neural networks, which is the architecture used in both the first and second paper, and they don't receive one-dimensional vector inputs of images, which is the approach that the second paper used. And this actually gets to something that we talked about in my video on explainable AI, which is that creating a model that has the same input-output relationship as a neuron doesn't mean that the model is performing the same computations as a neuron. There is more than one way to arrive at the same result. The shorter version of this is captured in the saying, all models are wrong, but some are useful, and ties back into a debate within the neuroscience community on whether it makes sense to model something that we don't understand, the brain, using something that we also don't completely understand, neural networks. In short, I think that this work is super interesting because it gives us a new way of understanding the brain in terms of translating the complexity of neurons to the complexity of neural networks. It also shows us that deep neural networks and deep learning aren't necessarily the solution to every problem. There might be simpler architectures or just different architectures that are even more powerful. Does this mean that we'll be able to use machine learning to model the entire brain anytime soon? Honestly, I'm not sure. The challenge in that is more than just designing the right model, it's also collecting a truly massive amount of data from how neurons are connected to each other to what makes them fire. In fact, it's not clear that creating a network that captures the dynamics of individual neurons would actually replicate how our brains work anyway. In other words, while the computational neuroscientist in me is super interested in seeing where all of this goes, there's still a lot we have to learn when it comes to neuroscience and machine learning. This video was made possible by Weights and Biases. If you don't already know, Weights and Biases makes fast and easy to use developer tools that help you track, visualize, and optimize your deep learning projects. In fact, their library is used by companies like OpenAI to track ongoing projects. I highly recommend them to people at any stage in their machine learning journey, and if you have an open source, academic, or personal project that you'd like to try, you can use Weights and Biases for free. Get started with your own ideas, or use their reports to improve your skills and understanding of anything from language models to music generation. And if you have questions or just want to chat, you can join their Slack community. You should also check out Gallery by Weights and Biases, which is a place where anyone can read and publish curated machine learning research tools and best practices. It's the ideal publishing platform for ML because you can augment your writing with model predictions, metrics, and custom charts. Even if you aren't interested in developing machine learning models yourself, Weights and Biases host regular podcasts and webinars on a variety of topics, so if you like my videos, you'll probably like them too. If this sounds interesting to you or you want to check out the gallery, sign up for Weights and Biases using the link in the description to start tracking your machine learning projects in less than five minutes. If you like this video, you can let me know by subscribing to my channel and smashing the like button. You can also check out my video on explainable AI, where I talk about how developing explainable models for black box algorithms is more complicated than it seems. Otherwise, you can follow me on Instagram or Twitter to keep learning about artificial intelligence with me, and I'll see you on Monday. Bye!